G'day folks, Ashley here, and today I'm going to talk about the performance and limitations of the Cessna 152. It's a great little trainer aircraft. It was not the first aircraft I flew, however, I have I did own one at one stage when I was working for Independence Air. It was a Part 121 airline which filed for bankruptcy, and as a result I actually had to sell it because I couldn't afford to keep it. However, in the time I did have it, I really enjoyed flying it, and it was a great, great time builder. I just wish I had more time to fly on it at the time. But there are, there are some uh, simple limitations as a pilot you need to be aware of for this aircraft. Uh, first of all, this aircraft at full throttle, you can climb out at between 65 and 75 knots. Uh, the normal climb out speed for a best rated climb at sea level is 67 knots. So I generally try to aim for about 70 because it's a bit easier to hit 70 on the airspeed indicator rather than 67. Uh, the best angle of climb is 55. Uh, normal approach speed with the flaps up is between 60 and 70 knots. Generally, sometimes people go in between, so about 65. Normal approach speed with 30 degrees flaps is between 55 and 65, so you'd probably aim for about 60. And a short fit approach landing with flaps 30, your minimum speed is 54, so you wouldn't want to go any slower than that. Uh, the aircraft itself holds a total of 26 gallons of fuel, of which 24.5 gallons is usable. Uh, 2400 RPMs, you're typically looking at about 6 gallons per hour consumption rate. Some of the things to keep in mind actually during takeoff or even any time of flight really, uh, the stall speeds. Uh, if you have flaps up, uh, the stall speed's 48 knots. And with flaps down, the stall speed is 43 knots. Your maximum takeoff weight is 1670 pounds. Both takeoff and the maximum landing weight are the same. Holds a total of 26 gallons of fuel, which is 156 pounds worth, of which 24.5 gallons is actually usable. Uh, the maximum, that's, well, 24.5 gallons of usable fuel works out to be approximately four hours of endurance. However, the FAA requires during day of EFR flight you have to have a minimum of 30 minutes reserve fuel on board when you land. So therefore, really it's three and a half hours endurance maximum, but that's based on six gallons an hour. From one aircraft to another, depending on the engine settings and your mixture settings, it might vary a little bit from six to a little bit above or a little bit below. So I use six gallons per hour as an approximation for, for estimates, but uh, you don't want to sit in this aircraft for three and a half hours. It's actually just too cramped and too uncomfortable, too noisy. There's too many vibrations, you know, after two hours it actually starts to get quite uncomfortable. So I wouldn't want to go any more than three hours at the absolute maximum before coming into land so I can get out and stretch my legs. And even at 300, for a three hour limit, you're still looking at between 280 and 300 nautical mile range based on the true airspeed that you're going to get. This aircraft uses 100 low lead av gas, which is six pounds per gallon. You have a useful load of about 574 pounds Minus the 156 pounds with full tanks, full fuel, it leaves you with about 418 pounds for two people on board this aircraft. I weigh about 200 pounds, and so therefore I can't really take anyone weighing more than about 218 pounds with full fuel. If someone else coming with me weighs a bit more than that, then I have to start taking off fuel in order to lose weight on the aircraft, the maximum takeoff weight. Uh, some of the airspeed limitations, the never exceed speed, VNE, is 149, which is the red line on the airspeed indicator. The VNO, the normal operating speed, is the green arc, which indicates up to 111 knots. Uh, the manoeuvring speed at maximum takeoff weight, 1,670 pounds, is 104 indicated airspeed. Uh, the maximum flap extension speed is 85 knots, and that's indicated by the white arc on the airspeed indicator. Now, this is an interesting one. The maximum window opening speed is 149 knots. Now, why you want to open the window at 149 knots beats the hell out of me. I have no idea why you'd want to do that. I cannot imagine how noisy, windy, and uncomfortable that would be. I've never done it, but it would be awful. So I, I don't even recommend you open the window in flight anyway. Uh, the maximum horsepower out of this engine is 110 brake horsepower with a maximum engine speed of 2,555 RPM and that's indicated by the green arc on the RPM gauge. Uh, minimum oil pressure is 25 psi and maximum oil pressure is 100 psi. Now for navigation purposes in cruise, 
Uh, the performance charts, I'll just read off some of the standard, what to expect in standard ISA conditions. Uh, if you're cruising at about 2,000 feet pressure altitude with 2400 RPM, you can expect a true airspeed of 101 knots with a fuel consumption of 6.1 gallons per hour. At 2,000 feet pressure altitude, if you're using 2300 RPM, which is what I'd recommend, uh, you're going to get a true airspeed of about 96 knots and a fuel consumption of about 5.4 gallons per hour. And so if, you, if your consumption is 5.4 gallons an hour and you're using a computation of about 6 gallons per hour, it's increasing the safety factor a little bit. If you're cruising at a pressure altitude of 4,000 feet and you're using 2400 RPM, you can expect a true airspeed of about 101 knots and a fuel consumption of about 5.7 gallons per hour. If you're going to use 2300 RPM, which I would recommend, uh, you can expect a true airspeed of 95 knots and a gallons per hour consumption rate of about 5.1. Uh, 6,000 feet pressure altitude at 2400 RPM, you'll get about 100 knots true airspeed and a consumption rate of fuel of about 5.4 gallons per hour. 2300 RPM, the recommended one, I recommend. 95 knots true airspeed and 4.9 gallons per hour consumption rate. So, with exception to 2400 RPM at 2000 feet pressure altitude, everything's going to be below 6 gallons per hour and some of it considerably quite a bit lower than 6 gallons an hour. So, I go with 6 gallons per hour consumption rate for calculation purposes. I always go with full fuel in this aircraft, so I'll take all 156 pounds of fuel or 26 gallons of which 24.8 usable and from there calculate my maximum endurance and after three hours I'd want to get out anyway and stretch my legs so I'd for planning purposes I'd plan on making a stop within 300 nautical miles of wherever you're departing from if not a bit closer and make sure obviously they have fuel available otherwise you're going to be stuck there for a while so yeah, there's just some things to keep in mind when you're flying the Cessna 152. And the interior, the, the instrument panel is pretty straightforward. You've got obviously on the top left there, you've got the uh, airspeed indicator, which is relying on the pedostatic system. Uh, in the middle, you've got the artificial horizon, which is a vacuum driven gyro. To the right of that, you've got the altimeter, which is a pedostatic system telling you how far you are above the pressure altitude you set in the datum window. Below that you've got the uh, vertical speed indicator and to the left of that you've got the directional gyro which is once again the vacuum driven drum, um, vacuum driven gyro system and that's why they get that little vacuum gauge there that should be reading in the green arc and that's going to give you obviously a direction that you're facing provided you take, take the time to align it with the magnetic compass. And to the left of that you've got the uh, turn and bank coordinator which is an electrical driven gyro. And it's very simple, very straightforward, and it does the job. Obviously, there's a little clock in the middle there as well, telling you the time, which is useful for navigation purposes, taking note of the time when you're over certain locations and departing and arriving times. Uh, there's one VOR receiver, which works just fine. One ADF as well, so you can tune into NDBs, VOR receivers. There's no DME on board this aircraft. We have one VHF radio, one VHF uh, VOR receiver, one ADF receiver, or NDB receiver, I guess. Uh, one transponder, RPM gauge across the other side in front of the passenger seat there. And although you have the option to select COM2, there is only one VHF COM radio. So I think it's just a standard panel. So if someone has additional equipment installed, the selection options are already at the top there. And yeah, it's, it's a great little aircraft. I, I highly recommend trying to get hold of one if you can, just to rent one out and just fly it around. They're very, very simple to fly. They're very forgiving airplanes, very slow, but they're very forgiving, and they're, they're a lot of fun to fly. In the middle of summer, you do feel every single bump. Like, you'll be coming in on final, and if you can see there's a road you're going to be crossing over and it's a hot summer day, you'll actually feel the heat coming off the road before you land on the runway. I kid you not, you'll actually feel the thermals. It'll push you up and you'll feel it. It's, it's amazing how light they are. They're like flying little kites. And kind of the equivalent is probably the Cessna Skycatcher. If, if you don't get a chance to fly a 152, a Cessna Skycatcher is very similar. Because they're very light and they're very easy to fly. They're very forgiving aircraft. But um, the, the Cessna Skycatcher is obviously a lot more modern because you've got at least a G300 pan instrument panel inside with GPS. But this uh, 152 
in this flight simulator X Plane 11 obviously does not. So this is the very basic model and I really enjoy flying it and obviously there's no autopilot on this thing so you're constantly flying it manually as well. Trimming in this aircraft is a bit difficult because unlike real life there's no real feel in this control column that I'm using. I do have a control column here with um, the throttle quadrant but um, yeah obviously it's the feel of it is completely simulated and it doesn't resemble real life and so I do I must admit like flying in real life I actually rely on the feel of the control column a lot and I actually didn't realize it until I was doing a lot of flights in some simulators at a flight school just recently within the last year how much I rely on the actual feel and it's something simulators even at airline level level these seems in, in part 121 airlines like the feel of the control columns st it's still not the same as the real thing so and that's one thing I, I don't think they've really mastered that well but visually everything reads correctly and it, it's excellent for training purposes and reducing costs but the feel is just not not the same that's like the same with um flying the duchess in this simulator x-plane 11 like i won't be doing any multi-engine failures single engine failures or anything like that because it's just not realistic i don't have control pe any pedals and flying a single engine in a multi-engine aircraft you need pedal work and it's just one of those things you just have to practice in real life in the actual aircraft because you just cannot simulate it in a simulator at all and that's why i don't bother with it in this program Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a little bit about the Cessna 152 and some of the things you've got to keep in mind when you're flying in route navigations and even just flying the aircraft in general. It's certainly worth giving it a go if you get a chance. Um, yeah, please like and subscribe this video if you've enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think of it. And Hey, thanks for watching. I'll see you later.